He calls himself one tough nerd, and he's given himself one tough leadership assignment to reinvent Michigan. The Honorable Richard D. Snyder, Governor of the State of Michigan, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. That's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with a student audience on campus at the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television, Midtown Detroit Studio. I'm Larry Phobes. When our guest first appeared on this show in the early 2006, he was a co-founder and CEO of private equity firm Ardesta and also chairman of Gateway Computers. His job description has changed. Thanks for being here, Governor. It's great to be with you, Larry. Your, cred your credentials leading up to Governor are a little bit unconventional. We talked about those a lot in the first show. Let's recap and, and link to the show. In education, you finished high school a semester early with 23 credits, college work already done, U of M, three degrees by the time you're 23. We've had a lot of uh, Wayne State University student leaders in the audience today. Were you a student leader on campus? Well, I actually didn't have much time for a lot of organizations. To give you some idea, I got my bachelor's when I was 19, my MBA when I was 20, and my law degree when I was 23. And I was working my way through school. So I had jobs going most of the time during the period. I had one year where I didn't work, but the rest of the time I was working two or three jobs to pay for school. Then when you started your career, uh, a path to uh, taught at U of M, mm -hmm. then to Cooper's Library as a tax accountant, Gateway Computer, when it was a smaller company, a few hundred. By the time you left, when it was several thousand employees, your president COO back to Ann Arbor and start our desk uh, uh, venture capital. Was there an aha moment along that path when you had a leadership insight that helps inform your leadership as governor? Well, from the leadership side, the biggest thing that helped me during that entire time would have been the concept of mentorship in terms of being very fortunate. This is something I looked at when I was actually picking what jobs I was going to take to say was I going into an environment where I could learn from people that literally they could help me grow and be a better person and that was critically important so if one thing that came out of it that I still am a huge advocate of today is mentorship either in terms of being a mentee or a mentor um, because I believe it really does make a difference in people's lives. While you were in Ann Arbor leading Ardesta, you stayed on the board at Gateway Computer and then had a chance to serve as non-executive chairman for a couple of years. Was that in hindsight, and you said on the first show that being non-executive chair was a more difficult job than being CEO because you had to lead by persuasion, you couldn't put out a directive. Was that in hindsight perhaps a good training to be governor where if you want to make changes in policy, it has to go through the legislature, a different branch of government? Yeah, it was helpful in, in many respects because you weren't having direct impact. It was indirect impact and you had to work as part of a team. And I found that experience to be very helpful not only at Gateway but in doing startup companies uh, in terms of being on a board. And it's interesting that, that I had the benefit of being someone that had been in the CEO seat and the chair seat and understand both sides because too often it's much like with the legislature. You can get miscommunication where you can literally be on the same page or moving in the same direction it's just you approached it differently and I can break through those barriers because of that experience. Now also on that first show you, you explained to us a, a three-phase career plan that you'd invented high school or college. First stage is work in the, in the private sector learn all you could from there and, and accumulate the means to take care of your family. The third stage was education to be a teacher in high school or college. 
The second stage was public service. Oh, yeah. When we did that show in 2005, were you already thinking about a run for governor? No, not necessarily. Uh, but the good part is hopefully you can see the, the, I stick to my plans <laughs> and they work out reasonably well. No, it was about public service and it wasn't necessarily even running for office. It was a chance to get back um, because the idea with the private sector career is get the experience, um, be able to support my family and then have the opportunity to say, hey, now can I just go help people where I don't have any special interests, vested interests, ties, I can just sort of hopefully just do the right thing. And the good part is this opportunity came about and I appreciate my family support. My wife is the one that really started the dialogue going that made it all happen. How did she do that? Um, we were out to dinner one night. We were on date night. I thought it was a nice quiet Friday night back in early 2009 and I thought I was just relaxing with her and all of a sudden she goes, I can see you're going crazy about what's going on in Michigan. You should think about running for governor and we should talk about it as a family and it's like wow, this is <laughs> a little bit different. And so we, we, had a, we talked as a family for a month um, because it was a family decision to do this. And it was a 10-year plan potentially, two years running, and if I, I'm fortunate enough to earn a second term, it would be eight years as governor. So it was a major family commitment. When you're sorting through the decision to run or to not run, how do you make an informed decision about whether to invest that big amount of energy and time to actually run and then what it means to serve if you're elected. Yeah, because, uh, well, one thing is uh, it's much like a startup and being an entrepreneur, and that helped me a lot in terms of someone that had done startups because you don't have the answers to all these questions. And campaigning is one of the most consuming experiences anyone can ever go through. Uh, I really got to enjoy it, but it is an all-consuming kind of experience. And you learn a lot about yourself from doing that. So I, I put it as a positive experience. Um, but if you had to say you had to do it every day for multiple years, um, not many people would be up for that challenge. You, you described it as a startup. I looked at one of the early poll results, early in the election. You were low enough in the polls that if you took the negative side of the statistical error, you had negative chance of winning the election. Yeah. Is, is it easier to, to design and run a campaign when you really are a, an outsider and you're coming in because you don't have everybody watching every move, listening to every word? Not necessarily. Most people would just say I was nuts back then, <laughs> if you really want to know. And the, the comment I have today, and for the earliest supporters, I, I have fun with it. I say they're in the margin of error club, just because of you said that, that literally I could have been a negative number. No, it's a belief in what you're doing. That's the right thing to do. It wasn't about um, politics. It wasn't about traditional you know, ways of doing things. It was basically saying Michigan's broken and I believe we needed somebody with a whole new perspective to come and have an opportunity to show some leadership in our state. Do you think it's easier to try and make significant change in a company, in an organization, in a state when times are tough, when people are looking for some sort of redeeming direction to go in as opposed to when times are very good and there's money all over the place? Well, it's interesting. One of the hardest things I've had to do in all my career is get people to change in some fashion. Everybody likes change until it actually shows up and hits them personally. And everyone would pretty much goes, well, I really was in favor of that until I heard it was going to affect me. And then it's not such a hot idea. But the thing is, in difficult times, people tend to be more open to change. Um, you don't take advantage of it, but you recognize it and say, okay, now let's talk through this. Let's work together in partnership. Because what I try to avoid is telling people what to do. It's to say, let's talk about what are the facts, where do we need to go, here's common ground, and let's go. That's part of my philosophy of relentless positive action. So leadership's not about giving a directive and going back and drinking coffee. It's, it's, it's dialogue. Uh, absolutely, and that's something from the private sector and the public sector. And people have, there are some command and control people out there that just like to say my way or the highway. That's not my view. My view is, again, going relentless positive action is no blame, no credit. What's the problem on a factual basis? What's the common ground where most people can agree that there's a solution or there's something positive to happen and advance the cause and do it in a relentless fashion? And that's what I believe was a major contributor for much of what we achieved last year was it wasn't about picking fights, it was solving problems. The election happened November 4th, 2010, and you won with 58% of the, of the popular vote. What were the biggest leadership surprises walking into the office? Well, the biggest one was is I, I first started going to meetings and after people would say hi and everyone's pretty nice to the governor when you first get started is the first words out of their mouth were, I want money or I need money. And it was like, think about that. If I went out to you and said, give me 20 bucks, Larry, are you just going to say, sure, here's $20? 
You don't do that in your personal life. You don't do it in your private life. But somehow, government, the private, public sector attitude was is you just hand out money. And ultimately, I got to the approach of, so what? You know, when I I just want money, I'm here to help show real results to real people. So instead of asking for money, tell me what the problem is, what the solution is. Let's prioritize it then, see how it stacks up. And if appropriate, we'll try to find good resources to make a difference. But let's measure it and make sure we are showing real results. Let's compare a little bit the experience of leading in the corporate world versus uh, serving as governor. In the corporate world, most companies have some sort of commonly accepted vision and set of goals. In the United States, government is set up purposefully to be checks and balances. And you add in multi-parties, there's that many more viewpoints. How did you have to change your leadership style when you came in from corporate world to government? Well, it didn't change a lot in terms of, again, I've had the same philosophy about problem solving, working together, being inclusive instead of divisive. The thing you have to learn through this process, though, in the capacity of the day, and it comes up. It's surprising when people say, well, did someone dislike this? And what I found is even when I do something nice, even when I give someone an award or something positive, um, somebody else isn't going to like it. So in the corporate world, you could get it where basically everyone would agree it's a good thing. Um, even when I do the nicest things, giving somebody a proclamation, there's liable to be some group out there that didn't think they deserved it or somebody else should get it, and they're going to be mad at me for doing that. When you came into office, it was a tough time for the state. Mm -hmm. and, and people described it as having grinding pessimism out there. Empl unemployment was soaring. Uh, the economy was, was failing. How much of a governor's role in that situation is it to put in policy that structurally changes the, the economic environment in the state? And how much of the role is to be almost evangelical and help people have hope that there is going to be a future and the world's really not going to end this afternoon? Well, it's both. Um, again, there's a legislative policy role, but then there is a leadership role. And the way I describe it in many respects is, is the biggest issue in Michigan was not changing a law or regulation. It's changing our culture. Again, it's to move from negative, divisive, rearward-looking to positive, forward-looking, and inclusive. And so that's the huge challenge, and that doesn't happen overnight. So where they go together, though, is politicians talk too much. And so one of the challenges you get when you're talking about changing a culture is to earn credibility to say it really is happening. So the part I'm proud of is we did a lot of policy things, legislative actions, regulatory actions, to say we're not here talking all the time. We're out doing things that are solving problems that have been in Michigan for 10, 20, in some cases 50 years. And that helps give you credibility on the message about the need for cultural change. So they complement one another. It's a symbiotic relationship. When you came into the office, how did you decide which things to do first with all the list of things on your plate? Yeah, you start with the most important. And that, that was really the fundamental of budget and tax reform. And the classic being the Michigan business tax. Um, it was interesting. Everybody else running, all the traditional politicians said, cut it by 20%, get rid of the surcharge, do this or that. The Michigan business tax is a fundamentally dumb tax. And so I go to simple math. If you have something dumb and divided by two, it's still dumb. So the idea was, is let's recognize this was job killer. It was killing job creation in our state. And it was getting rid of it was actually getting to a fairer answer because our small business people that create jobs are now paying the same rate you and I are paying, where they're being asked to pay an unfair amount. So you start with the simplest, biggest things, get them on the table, do the toughest things, and get them behind you so you can advance the cause in a positive way. So when, when you came into office, the economy was down, unemployment was starting, people are in a bad mood. Your reaction was a reinvent Michigan program, and, and we'll talk about that quite a bit. There's 100 case studies out there where corporate leaders have tried to reinvent their company into something all new, all different, almost unrecognizable from from where they started, and the results usually the same. They go out of business. Why is reinventing Michigan different? Because it's not unrecognizable. We had just lost our course. Because if you look at it, I call it Michigan 3.0. And I'll go back to 1.0 was the natural resources era, the 1800s. 2.0 was the industrial era. And if you think about it, Michigan was the innovation and entrepreneurial capital of the world in the early part of the last century. And the point is, is we were so successful, we sort of got complacent. We lost our way and got in trouble that 40 years of decline. So my point is, is this isn't something all new. We led the world in innovation and entrepreneurship before. 
why don't we go back to the roots of what made us great in 2.0 and do it again in 3.0 in the era of innovation? So it's going back to fundamentally of who we are. We had just sort of forgotten that. So it's, it's doing what we do better. It's not, we're not going to become the grapefruit farmers of North America or something like that. No, I'm proud of the auto industry, manufacturing, agriculture is doing great. We have so many legacy things we can build on and it's going really well. We, we are on the path to reinventing Michigan and it's exciting. Thanks for being here, Governor. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk more with Michigan Governor Rick Snyder about reinventing Michigan. Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, and we're talking about his initiative to reinvent Michigan. One of the things that you're obviously focused on, let's talk about some of the things you're focused on in reinvent Michigan. First of all, economy and jobs. For the economy, there's a couple of different approaches out there. One is some states, some leaders pick one or two industries that they think are the, the real torches and focus on those, nice efficient mm -hmm. approach. Others use a, a broader approach to create a really strong business climate and then let capitalism do its work. What's your choice? Well, I'm in the second camp because the first camp, I can tell you from first person experience, I'm not sure it's a great answer. Um, government's not good at picking winners and losers. I was a venture capitalist where I was paid to pick winners and losers. It's really hard work. and. You do it on a portfolio basis, where for the few winners you pick, you're going to have quite a few losers, too. So I don't like that model from a government approach. The government's role, in my view, isn't to create jobs. It's to create an environment where jobs can flourish. Because again, the jobs should be coming from the private sector or other organizations, but we need to create that environment that fosters results in success, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and that's what I focus on. Another piece of reInvent Michigan is jobs. We've, we keep hearing about um, employers who can't find people with the right skills, so jobs go unfilled, people leave the state um, to find better work, people in all sorts of skilled trades, crafts, professions. The answer that often comes up is training and education. That takes years. Mm -hmm. People want jobs now. What do you do? Well, the interesting part is, and I have a fairly strong philosophy, and I did a special message back in November on this, because I don't even like the term workforce development. Workforce development is important. Education is obviously important. But we need to invest in those, but we need to do more. And that's where our public sector didn't fully understand or make the full connection cycle. Because as you said, giving people the skills and then stopping, how much sense does that make? So the way I like to describe it is we need to do three things. One is creating talent, creating this environment, which is education, workforce development, which is, we can't walk away from that, we need to invest more, but the missing elements are collaboration and connecting. Collaboration is, it shouldn't just be government, it's partnering with the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, good things working together, and then connecting are great things we're doing, such as mitalent.org, which is our new portal that I encourage all the college students to go to that are here, because it's a job site, but it's also a career site where people can do such as investment return on a career. There's a calculator there to help calculate what you'd get from your entire lifetime earnings from a particular career. Those are the kind of connections. Those are the kind of connections we need to be doing for people that, again, just weren't in the typical mindset of the public sector. So I think we're really innovating here and going to be a leader. Another piece of reinvent Michigan is finances, government finance. There's only two ways to adjust a budget, right? You can increase uh, revenue, decrease cost. The devil's in the details about what's going to be cut, what's going to be, uh, where's the growth going to happen, how are you going to cut job, and where are you going to spend the money you've got. How do you make the choice which programs to cut, which programs to, which uh, ways to increase revenue, knowing that in most cases anything you do is going to help part of your constituency and potentially uh, punish other parts of your constituency. Yeah, well, one of the things I don't believe in is just doing an across-the-board cut or increase because that's not good management. That's actually walking away from being a good manager. You do have to prioritize. 
but the priorities that I got elected on, that people wanted me to reinvent Michigan, were more and better jobs and creating a future for our young people. The other thing that I am sensitive to in terms of the difficult times we're going through is the safety net feature because we have tough times and we do need to be sensitive to people that are in our greatest need. For example, while we were doing all the budget cuts last year, one of the areas we increased was actually in children's services for our most in need, for foster kids. We worked hard in the Medicaid area. Um, so it's a balancing act, but it is a long-term focus. The biggest piece that's missing, Larry, is not just that, though, is too often the public sector and government has ignored the balance sheet to say we've got all these liabilities. So one of the biggest problems that we are actually showing fiscal responsibility now is the state of Michigan and most jurisdictions across the country were running up essentially their, either their mortgage or their credit card debt, if you put it in the terms of a family, and paying no attention to what those balances were. And that was not being as responsible as we should be, and so now we're focused in on those. There's another piece of corporate uh, thinking that you're bringing into this whole mix. It's the dashboards, hard metrics. Is that a tool where you're able to communicate with constituency how things are going? Is it a tool for you to keep focused on, the, uh, on where you are? But isn't it dangerous for a governor to tell the citizens that I said I'd do this, but I didn't? Don't care. I should be graded. I mean, again, that's where I'm here to give the facts. And I'm here to give honest assessments of what's working well and what's not. And my view is, is I shouldn't be looking at that as a relevant decision-making criteria. I'm here to show the best results I can for our citizens, and that's what I'm focused on. And the interesting part is we talked about change a little bit earlier. The funniest part is when you start putting in metrics like this, the reaction of a lot of people in government or other places, whoa, I don't like that. Now someone can see how I'm doing. But I go the other way. How do you know you're succeeding? How do you show success if you don't measure it? And that's part of the cultural change I'm getting people to understand is don't walk away from being measured. Use it as a way to say, hey, we've gotten this done, so now we can raise the bar to get that done. As governor, how do you change the culture of, of the administration, of government, of the state? Change your mindset. That's, that's a new role for governors, isn't it? Well, it is, but I view that's an important role, and a lot of it is being a good role model. It's much like I talked about the importance of mentoring, a, a variation of that as being a good role model. And the way I view it is, is it's not what you say, it's how you act, too. Again, this goes to the point of politicians talk too much. So, and that's not my strongest suit anyway, most likely. It's really to say, this is what we said we were going to do, and I'm proud if you go back to what I campaigned on. Pull out what I campaigned on. Have I followed through on what 58% of the population wanted me to do um, while I'm doing them? It, it, some people may look back and say, well, I'm not sure I wish you would have done it, but that's why I got elected, so I'm trying to follow through and do my job that you hired me to do. Our government, we talked before, in the United States is set up for uh, checks and balances. Mm -hmm. If you look in the paper, there seems to be some extreme cases floating at all levels across the nation where we're not just doing discourse, we seem to be stopped. How do government leaders, in general, change the system so that we get out of this, we get back to discourse, discourse uh, discuss, and do something, as opposed to argue and stop? Yeah, we're a role model for that new model. It's relentless positive action. I mean, I'm very proud to say, have you seen me criticize the president? Have you seen me criticize the mayor? Have you seen me out blaming anyone for anything or even taking credit for things? Um, I don't see value in that. Um, I see value in terms of solving problems. And I think we're on to something, and that's where I feel very passionately about that, that we're following a different path in terms of promoting what I hope is the future. Because again, I use the federal debt ceiling question as a classic illustration. In Michigan, we got our budget done faster, the fastest in the last 30 years. We cut a billion and a half dollar deficit out. We're making payments on long-term liabilities. We're setting a foundation for our future. Look at the federal government. If they, on their debt ceiling question, if they would have agreed that they're not gonna blame anyone or take credit for anything, they would have solved the problem and the only people that would have suffered was the press because they wouldn't have had anything to write about and our economy would be better and we'd have more jobs today. Governor, I've got one last question. Your third uh, stage of your career, you said, was to be a teacher in high school, mm -hmm. college. A lot of educators believe that it's better to help educate students at a very young age. So let's make you, hypothetically, a kindergarten teacher. What are you going to teach five-year-olds about leadership so they'll be better citizens when they grow up? It's to start with being a good person and being an honest person. 
because a lot of people like to say, you know, I got all the degrees and I did it pretty quick, but the most important thing to me is my integrity. To say that I'm an honest person, that I deal up straight with people and you move on from there and then you build on that. But you start with a strong foundation. Thanks for being here, Governor. It's great to be with you. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available online for viewing at dptv.org.